In this video, I want to show you how to write a really good PhD proposal. And this will be relevant if you're just applying for a PhD or also if you're kind of halfway through maybe your PhD and you need to submit, you know, this extended proposal or a transfer report as sometimes it's called to be allowed to continue with your PhD. And I'm going to show you a proven model that works really well and I'm going to break it down into simple steps as well that you need to follow and show you the exact structure, the language that you need to be using so that really with all of that you'll be able to walk away and finish writing your proposal later today. So let's dive in and see how this is done. So I want to first talk about the overall structure and of course this can differ you know depending on the university and you do want to check the requirements first. This is sort of based on coaching over 200 PhD students and helping them write a really good proposal or a transfer report, first year report, however you want to call it. So the approximate length is sort of between 4,000 and 5,000 words. You know, if you're just applying for a PhD, this will be much shorter. This can be like 1,500 or something like that, so 2,000. If you're sometimes, you know, you might be required to write a little bit more than that, like I've seen, you know, like even up to 10,000, but some people just go crazy and write like 20,000. That's definitely not what you should do, right? But, you know, check the word limits with your university. This is like the approximate. And of course, if you need to write, you know, 2,000, then just divide these word limits by two. And if you write, need to write 8,000 instead of 4,000, just multiply it by two, right? It's that simple, you know? And this is the overall structure and the flow, you know? So again, you know, this might differ slightly from university to university, but I wouldn't get hung up on it, right? So that there is an overall flow that 99% of the proposals follow. Like the, the small details might vary, but really, you would struggle to find a research proposal that doesn't have these elements usually in this order. So I would just stick to it and follow it and just adapt it slightly to whatever the requirements for your university are, right? And these are the elements, right? And what we're gonna do is just go over each of these elements. I'm gonna show you an example and we're going to go over each of them and see how this is actually done in practice because I think that will be more valuable seeing the example in practice. All right, so let's look at the model of the research proposal that we've got here or a transfer report, right? And this comes from my program, PhD Accelerator. If you're interested in, you know, finishing your PhD faster, uh, publishing papers regularly, then schedule a free one-to-one -one consultation. Uh, we'll talk about your problems, um, your goals, and we'll see if PhD Accelerator is a good fit for you. Um, but I thought I'd share this model with you because it's helped a lot of my clients to write a really good proposal. So I'll briefly kind of explain the structure. In here you had the bird's eye overview, let's say, but now let's just briefly explain what the what the structure here is, right? So the first part is background and literature review, and that's, you know, about 1,500 words approximately. What we do here is like we need to review the main topics from the literature that are relevant to our research question. And we usually do that from general to specific. Now, if you're confused about how to do a literature review, I've got another video in which I talk in a lot of detail about how to structure a literature review, how to write it, what language to use, and so on. So you should dive in there. But this basically reviews what we know so far. And the whole point of this, you know, is to lead us to the research gap or to the problem, to the justification. So everything that I'm doing here, the, the topics that I'm reviewing are related to my research aim and to my research questions and they lead to the justification, right? That's kind of the overall flow. Now, in the justification, what you wanna do is spend about you know 500 words or so justifying um, your research question or your research aim. That's, you know, that's basically what you need to do. And um, in order to do that, you probably need, you know, two or three paragraphs in which you will present the research gap. And each research gap has to be connected to each research question or research aim, right? Um, if you're not sure about what a research gap is, I've got another video 
um, in here where I explain that in detail. But really, you know, you want to be talking about like a lack of research or insufficient research, limitations of previous studies, some sort of lack of knowledge or controversy in your field, or some sort of like practical problem that needs resolving. These are the usual research gaps that we want to talk about, right? Um, so, you know, you can see very clearly that in this paragraph, I just identify like a lack of research, that this is an unexplored area, right? I also identify like, you know, the, the geographical gaps that it has, research has been conducted, but it's limited to certain regions of the world, right? Which is, of course, problematic, right? Um, and then also, you know, the way this problem has been explored is also problematic, right? So I point out sort of limitations of previous um, studies and also the fact that, you know, most of those studies are quantitative, right? And they only use questionnaires, right? So these are some of the research gaps that are pointed out um, in here, right? So that's, that's what you, you need to do really. And remember that, you know, each needs to be kind of connected to each of your research questions. So when we move to like the research objectives, questions, aims, you know, it needs to be clear how these objectives connect to these research gaps and justifications that you've identified here and how they connect to the literature. So basically, you know, if we were to go over this in a lot of detail, which I'm not going to do uh, because it would take a lot of time, is you would see that like basically each paragraph here in the literature review kind of, you know, introduces the, the research gap that I'm going to talk about later or the topic of the research gap. And then all these kind of research gaps here are connected to each of my objectives in here, right? That's, that's kind of how it works. And you might be wondering, okay, should I have objectives, aims, research questions, really the one and the same thing. So I'm always puzzled when I see you kind of, uh, or when I see some of my clients initially, like they, they give me the work and they have aims, objectives and research questions and hypotheses. And I'm like, well, what's the point of all of this? Like, this is all the same. Like, basically, a, an aim is an objective. They're just kind of synonyms. Like, I know some supervisors might want to split hairs in five and say, like, no, an aim is more general, an objective is more specific, blah, blah, blah. But that's a load of nonsense. Like, it's just the same thing. And the same, you know, like, a research question is basically a, a research aim or an objective framed as a question, right? So all of these could be framed as questions, like a research question or objective is exactly the same thing, it's just framed in a different way. Same for a hypothesis, like, you know, a hypothesis is basically, you know, a prediction of something. So all of these objectives could be framed as hypothesis as well, right? So just have one, whichever feels more appropriate. And then we've got the methodology, right? And um, it, it follows a very predictable pattern that might vary slightly depending on the field that you're in, but it's, you know, it's very easy to follow. Like the first thing you want to talk about is like who or what you studied. So in my case, you know, I studied people, so I talk about participants, but maybe you are studying, I don't know, animals, or maybe you're studying, uh, you know, some particles, or maybe like enzymes or bacteria or whatever. So whatever you're studying, that, that's usually the first section of um, of the proposal, of the methodology, right? It's like materials, right? Um, and you need to tell us like what you studied, how you obtained this thing, you know, why was it appropriate to obtain it like this, you know, the numbers, how many, and so on, right? Don't worry if you don't know the exact numbers because, you know, your study is still ongoing, you're just proposing it, right? But you need to have an approximate idea, otherwise, you know, your proposal will not be accepted. And then we move on to the methods, right? So this is sometimes called materials, if you're, especially if you're studying material things, not human beings, right? And then we've got methods. In the methods, you know, you first might want to introduce like the overall approach, you know, which in my case was mixed methods, right? So I define what, what this research methodology means, what it involves, and I justify it. And notice as well that we are referring to the literature in here, and that's very, very important to refer to the literature when you're providing justifications or definitions of your research methodology. So this kind of gives like a more high-level view of like my overall method or approach. And again, please don't ha get, you know, caught up in this like, should it be called a research design approach or methodology, 
right? It's all kind of the same thing, you know, and I think like too many supervisors just like get you into the weeds and lost by like arguing, no, this is a design and then you have approach and this is, the... it's just, you know, it's just the same thing. And it just talks about like overall, what is our approach in here and why this approach is appropriate for this particular study. And then afterwards, we talk about the research tools and, uh, and the procedures. So now we get into the nitty gritty of how we are actually going to do the study. So, you know, your tools can be things like, you know, specific, for example, like questionnaires, interviews, or like, you know, it can be like a specific technique for like, I don't know, looking at the enzymes or things like that, right? So if you have more than one research tool, you want to present each tool separately, like maybe in a subsection or at least clearly stated, right? And for each of those research tools, um, you know, you basically define the, the tool that you're going to use, you know, um, and you can refer to the literature when, when you're doing that, and then you can justify it um, as well, right? Or you can justify the different procedures, right? So I'm saying like, you know, there's going to be between six and 10 participants each, and then I have a justification why there's going to be six and 10, right? So in this section, like what you want to show is like um, your knowledge of like methodological theory that you clearly have thought and read about this approach and you know why you're doing it, you know, and you can refer to the literature, but you also want to show us like specifically what you will do. So a lot of people, the mistake that they make is that they make it too theoretical. It's got to be practical. So like you can see here, like, you know, I'm saying exactly how many people there will be and I'm saying what I'm going to do specifically, right? So this is something that you need to do. And then, yeah, you see second, so I move to the next research tool, right? And then, you know, you, if it's a questionnaire or something like this, you might sometimes need to provide a lot of details about it, right? So don't be like too high level. You need to tell us, like, we need to know what you will do specifically, what will be included, how you're planning to do, because a supervisor needs to assess whether you're capable of actually doing it and whether this makes sense, right? Um, if your method is complicated, you've got a lot of like tools and stuff like this, you could have a table like that, right? That has the objective of the study and then the method that you're using, the tool, and then, you know, uh, the sampling, for example, right? So this is what I present here. And then in the methodology, you want to talk about data analysis. So basically, you want to tell us how you will analyze your data, right? And, you know, again, if you're using different data analysis techniques, then, you know, present the first technique, if appropriate, justify why you're using it, and tell us step by step how you will analyze the data using the, this technique, and then move on to the second one, to the third one and so on. And again, like with the procedures and the research tools, you've got to be specific, right? Especially if, you know, if the data analysis involves several steps, we'll outline specifically what you are planning to do. And if necessary and appropriate, justify why you're using this research tool and not something else, right? So that's the last section of the methodology, right? And then if you're studying human or animal subjects, you might need to cover ethical considerations. If you're studying inanimate objects, particles, enzymes, those kind of stuff, you obviously don't need ethical considerations, right? Now, what we need as well is a suggested time frame, right? Um, you could make it fancy, nice looking, for example, Gantt chart. I know there are things like that. Um, it's up to you. You know, you could definitely present it in a more visually appealing way, let's say. But what matters is the substance and the detail in here, right? So for example, in here, like I'd recommend that you divide it into semesters, like semester one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, however semesters you're going to be studying. And for each semester, you know, I'd recommend like three big tasks that you're gonna have, right? So for example, a literature overview or literature review is a big task, right? And then like in here, there's, this is to do with methodology, like sort of like contacting the participants. And then this is to do with methodology as well, designing the tools, right? These are big um, tasks, right? 
So try to do that as well, like that you have these different necessary tasks. There should be room for writing, there should be room for reading the literature, analyzing the data, conducting the study and so on. And this needs to be in a plan. And I would just recommend a table like that to keep it simple. Now, importantly, you want to talk about your research limitations as well, right? Um, so you want to critically think about any potential problems and importantly, how you're planning to resolve those problems, right? So if things go wrong, what, what are you planning to do? What, what is your plan B? Often the supervisors are interested in that. But also, you know, if you uh, see a limitations of your study, like try to maybe defend your approach because any approach will have limitations and problems, right? Um, but it's also about like how you justify what you did, right? So try to defend yourself or prepare a plan B or show why your study still contributes, right? So this is what you need to do um, here, right? And then what you want to outline is like possible practical implications and or uh, and really not or and contributions, right? So basically, you know, what we're looking for here is how your research is novel, how it contributes and so on, right? That's what you want to talk about here. And if your research is practical, like what practical implications it has. And that's what you should point out here. And as you can see, this section is very short. And then of course you have references, right? So this is the overall structure um, of a proposal. I hope it was, um, it was helpful. Now, if you found this useful, but you want more personalized help with writing research papers or an excellent PhD thesis, then definitely schedule a free one-to-one -one consultation, either with myself or with my team. We're going to get and speak to you one-to-one -one and identify the biggest challenges that you're facing, the goals that you want to achieve, and then we'll outline a personalized plan that will help you to achieve those goals faster. And the link to that free one-to-one -one consultation is right below this video.